right, it's uh, 531. We'll go ahead and start the uh, the joint meeting of the uh, those trustees and the uh, Morristown select board members. Uh, first, I'll uh, hand it to you for uh, introduction. Sure. So welcome, everybody. I thought it'd be good if we go around and everybody could introduce themselves and say how many years you've been serving on your respective boards. And we can start at the head table. Jason Luno, the interim town administrator. I'm Scott Johnstone. I'm the village manager. Travis Knapp. Richard Craig. Bob Ingham. Don McHale. Tom Smith. Judy Bickford. Chris Palermo. Brad Limoges. Laura Streets. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, Pardon me. Uh, yeah, Judy Alberry, Bonnie McDermott. And if you can make sure Bonnie can see your name tags, Brad and Chris. I just need to know who's speaking when you speak. Thank you. Okay, before we start the uh, meeting, we have a, a list of issues, and we try to put a time limit on that, which you know, it would take a few seconds just to make sure we're we're tracking. Um, um, and also, I just remind everybody to to, uh, to kind of keep it straightforward and not get into the weeds um, and not repeating your, repeating what has been already said before. Uh, that way, we can kind of keep things moving and, and try to get things accomplished at this meeting. Um, so, if we're ready, we'll start with. Uh, we're going to do that. Yeah, we're going to start with number one: the joint rules for subordinate board policy. We'll go into discussion about that. We're going to kick that off. Um, I will. Um, I This was something that, uh, having been on both the DRB and uh, the planning, has been a long time coming. Uh, I think there's incredible support for it from our public. Um, this Our select board supported it. I have to say I was in, incredibly disappointed and um, rather insulted that the, that the trustees just didn't even bother to vote on it. So I asked to table it on our end uh, to ask the trustees to reconsider it because I think it's a very important policy. Anybody else? And specifically, Laura, you're referring to the language that would restrict the number of boards that one person could be a member of? Yes. And again, that was for so that we could open it up um, so that more local residents could participate and to prevent any kind of conflict of interest so that people wouldn't have to step off because of a conflict of interest. Yeah, so I, I know I'm on record with the select board and I'll just say it again that uh, I think it is wise for us to think about um, not having select board members or trustee members sitting on the DRB planning or, or the planning council. That those, those, be, those be separate. And I agree, Laura. I think, uh, uh, I, I've said this a lot, you know, Morris, Morristown's a big town. There's a lot of us and there's more than enough of us to fill these boards. And I like the idea of reaching out to, to more uh, more individuals in town to sit on these sit on these boards rather than having one person occupy several seats. Thank you. I for one don't agree with it. I believe it's restricting people. Uh, it's not like they have an influx of people to fill these positions. You still haven't filled the MD uh, planning commission spot. When I was on the planning commission, we had to reduce it from seven to five because we didn't have enough people to be on the board uh, to maintain uh, any kind of consistency. And I just think anytime you limit somebody, or limit the voting of people in town or, or in village. I, I don't think that's a good idea. It's a it's a waste of time. That's my opinion. I personally am not in favor of, of the uh, of the policy either. Would anybody else from the trustees like to speak on it? Say I'm not in favor of it. I think that our town size is not that big, and that. Um, Participants are just not out there, and so to limit them with this rule is not good. So, I guess my question then is, why would the trustees not vote on it and and be noted as to whether you're for it or against it? To just not vote on it to me is just an insult to the public that it's not even worth your time. I think it's an insult. So, why not have a vote and and then make it clear that you're not for it, so that people know have it on record. 
don't think it was something we were required to vote on. So. It's no, it's it's something that keeps coming up, and it's just a waste of our time to keep uh, working on issues that don't affect the town or the village. That's not what we're here for. Besides, I trust the village, uh, uh, I trust the select board members to, to be uh, uh, trustworthy and when they select people for positions and, and for boards. I, and I trust the trustees that will make the right decision too. So I put my trust in those boards to make the right decisions when it comes to picking somebody for these uh, for these positions. So I'm not, uh, again, I'm not in favor of it. It's just, I like to move on to something more important. Okay, next, two. Uh, new and emergent state energy policy impacts on town and village. And I'll ask Scott to, to chime in because he's kind of an expert on this. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, you know, we, we thought it would be good to talk about this because while we run the electric utility and the, the energy systems in town, um, with, with the changes that are coming, it's going to impact like everybody in the village, everybody in the town. Um, it's going to impact operations in the town. It's going to impact decisions that you need to make about what you do and don't want to be involved with. So. So we thought we'd just give a very quick overview and then you go can start having a conversation about it. Um, so mostly it's predicated on, on a suite of laws that are, are have recently gone in place or are in the process of going in place. So the point here isn't to get all your opinions on these laws because they're coming and they're gonna happen to us. And so now the question is, what do we do about it? So the first one was the Global Warming Solution Act that passed a few years ago that really starts to push us towards um, really not using any fossil fuels for anything, not just electricity, but how you heat your home, um, how you drive your car, and you may or may not be in favor of those things. That's really not the point today, but the laws are the laws now, right? Um, and then um, we've had a renewable energy standard that said we had to be like 85% by 2045 um, renewable with electricity. Well, everyone expects that this coming legislative session, that's now going to be 100% by 2030. Um, so we're going to have almost no time to flip the way our system runs to be all renewable energy. At the same time, they've, had, they've passed the first stage of the clean heat standard, which essentially says all heating, all hot water, and all transportation um, it can no longer be uh, fossil fuels. And essentially, the law indicates that they want everything to be electrified. Now, it doesn't really... It leaves room for other ways to do it, which I'll mention to you in a minute. But essentially, it's you gotta you gotta um, electrify everything, and I'll give you a quick view of what that looks like. And in the meantime, the other bill that's starting to be taken up is kind of the who pays for all this bill. Um, love or hate net metering, putting it on your house. The way that's been designed from the beginning is that um, those that don't do it help pay for those that do. Um, that's the way that the incentives have been de um, designed. So if you're fortunate enough to put them on, you've been getting help with your bill. There's a law in the legislature to cap um, energy bills for low and moderate income people through a percentage of their income. So you're going to have a situation where folks with net metering aren't going to be paying the full freight. Low and moderate income folks aren't. And you're going to vastly increase the size of the electric system and have to invest tens of millions of dollars and the people in the middle are the ones that are going to have to pay for it. And um, that's essentially where the state laws are going, either already are or are going. In the middle of all that, we're developing our kind of companion document to the town plan, which is called an integrated resource plan. So where are we going to get, how are we going to make this all happen? It's a 30-year plan we have to do every three years. Um, um, we're in the middle of that. But essentially, we're realizing we're going to commit to 100% by 2030 because we have to. Um, that's going to mean battery storage. We also looked at if you really did make us electrify everything, what happens to our electric system? And it doesn't matter if you know what a megawatt is because it's all relative. Right now, our peak load is eight and a half megawatts. If you electrify everything and you don't control it in any way, we're at, we'll be at 29. So just from a sense of scale, how many times over that increases, we'll be at 29. If you could perfectly use the same amount of energy every hour of the, of the year, we'd be at 19. So we'll probably be like 22 or 23, so almost triple, which means every transformer, every wire, every substation, everything has to be upgraded, and we got to buy renewable energy contracts for all of that. So we'll be investing, you know, at least 50 million, if not 100, into the system in the next 20 years in a utility that has a budget of $7 million a year. Um, uh, so 
just to understand, it's really just to have you understand it. And then the key is this includes, for example, um, uh, electric vehicles as part of it. So now the town will have pressure about every every parking lot ought to have charging stations in it, right? Um, so we'll provide the power. You don't have to do it, but you'll have pressure coming at you for that. Most businesses will be looking for a partner to help them figure out how to do it. Um, so these issues are very quickly going to start coming at us all. We have some responsibility. People will probably try to pull you into it. You'll, you have choices to make as a select board. Um, doesn't mean you have to. And the same will be true of, of how are people going to get their heat. You know, the mostly all of the advertising is that electric heat pumps work no matter what the temperature is. And honestly, if it's much below zero, much below 10 above, their effectiveness goes down really quick. Unless you have a super insulated home and you're relying and you don't have a backup heating system, you're going to be cold. You're not going to freeze to death, but you're going to be cold mm -hmm. if that's all you rely on. So, you know, we may have to talk about as a joint village in town, putting thermal energy networks in, in certain parts of town, whether a new development where you can put some geothermal heat pumps in, put in two or three to heat the whole new development or the downtown area as a way not to electrify that. And because geothermal will work at any temperature, it's wonderful technology, just capital intensive. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have to look at all these things. And, and the other thing I would say is, you know, now that the state has an appetite for mandates, both in energy and in zoning, as I'm sure Todd has told you about the zoning mandates, mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't expect the state to stop overreaching and, and start telling us what we have to do. So don't be surprised if all of a sudden these energy laws trip into housing policy and all of a sudden you're you know you have a statewide mandate to say you must require in your planning process so um that's probably plenty for me to say to set the table for you um you know it's, it's we're going to spend a lot of money it's going to drive some cost um and it's going to include us all so scott just a, so you mentioned 85 percent in 2024 and then perhaps 2045 that, that's what the current law says. 2045? Yeah. But then they're going to go to 100%? By 2030. 2030, you think? That's what all the tea leaves would say. What are we now? We're around 70. 70. And I guess, yeah, I guess the question I have, I mean, when I look at the, when I think of energy and I think of more so electric, first I wish I was on it, but that would be <laughs> nice for my monthly bill. But um, what... I mean, I, I when I think about more so light, I, I think about the trustees, then I'll think about the select board. So, what do you, what do you see as what do you, what, do you, what do you see as something that the select board should be thinking about when it comes to the electrification of, of yeah. more so? I think definitely what what role is there for public charging, um, EV charging, because the public's going to start asking, how do you collaborate with your businesses in town? Um, you know, because it's not just going to be in the village; it's going to be in the town. Um, it, you know, do, are there places where we should be collaborating and, and whether through development rules or rules of the town to create these thermal energy networks? Um, what role do we have in that? We, we don't have to be the implementer, but we might need to enable it if we want to lower how much we have to build out our electric system, you know, and make sure that the heat actually works as opposed to what's being pushed on people now. So I, I think it's things like that, and it certainly is going to impact your operations because your costs are going to go up. You know, you know, it would seem pretty obvious to me that when you start having a mandate to get rid of all fossil fuels, that the cost of those fossil fuels is likely to go down at that point because there'll be fewer people offering them, there'll be less competition. There won't be anything they want to do as a business, but as it starts to take hold, there's just going to be less competition because there's going to be less people able to survive it. In a normal supply demand thing, right? Yeah, and talking to our legislator would obviously be important with all of this. Definitely, we got to be making sure they're aware so that there's some voices other than the advocates um, talking to them. As you probably know, I've spent a lot of time in the legislature in my career, and you know, the, it's a beautiful thing that we have a, a citizen legislature who really just, in theory, listens to people and come to a conclusion, um, and they don't have staff essentially. The problem is, therefore, when they need their technical information, they typically get it from advocates, you know, well-paid advocates and lobbyists who you know, give them information, and they don't have a lot of other places to turn to get information to compete with that. So it's really important for towns and villages and others to be letting local legislators know what we want. 
the last thing I would say is kind of leading up to that is I know you were there last year. I saw you at the breakfast with the legislators. It is a wonderful time for yeah. all of us to go and see our legislators. We do have their ears. There's no doubt about that. They are listening and it's good conversation. And great for those are coming up starting in January. Yeah. Can I ask about smart meters? Is going forward that we're going to have to get off fossil fuels? Brings up the current driving around. Um, are you guys looking to um, start transitioning and encouraging that with new development as yeah. opposed to having we're, to? We're going to have to start that. We are going to have smart meters on our system in another year, um, okay. in part because we got 50% of the money from, from COVID money, which is still our money, but it doesn't come to Morrisville. It's going to someplace in Texas or Oklahoma. So, yeah. um, so we are doing that, but we're going to have to figure out how to start encouraging, helping people with this transition because we're going to get a lot of questions yeah. about how do I do this. Yeah, yeah the conversion. Chris, did you have a question? Yeah. Scott, um, when you talk about uh, $50 million, $100 million to uh, upgrade your system here in Morrisville, mm -hmm. you know, as a utility in, in, in this area, um, you know, other municipalities like Stowe have their uh, electric uh, companies, and then you look at Green Mountain Power and Belco. How does, you know, these timelines and this expense get realistic in terms of meeting those guidelines? I mean, to me, I knew that the legislature, I'm a lobbyist in, in yep. Ontario as well, and the legislature draws this line in the sand and says, these are the mandates that we're handing down. But the reality is, is that when you put it on the ground, right. You know, where, where does that go? And and do you think it's realistic, these expectations for all these utilities? It's realistic at a price is what I would say. So we can go um, purchase what are called power purchase agreements with offshore wind off of Massachusetts or in Houston, Texas, or wherever. We can acquire renewable energy with renewable energy credits. You have to pay a price for those. To do it smart, to do it kind of the Vermont way, where we're trying to, you know, do the smartest economic thing we can, even within that box, which is, you know, some more local generation working with people trying to, to really find the best price will take longer. Can we get there by 2030? Absolutely. If they're going to mandate it, we can get there. It'll drive rate increases. It'll cost money. <clears throat> Sorry to be the bearer of wonderful news, but <laughs> yeah, real, reality often is. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, number three on the list is local option tax. And, um, I know Tom, when we were putting this together, Tom and I were talking, it sounds as if both groups are, are interested in uh, exploring this option. But if people want to speak to it, please feel free. I, I, um, have uh, been talking about local option tax um, with certain uh, departments here uh, in our uh, municipality. We cannot continue to um, do the things that we need to do infrastructure-wise in the town without a different revenue source. And if you take a look at um, Morris Town's um, sales and use tax, rooms and meals tax, um, the um, alcohol tax. If we took a look at you know, a local option tax on those gross receipts based on 2022 uh, annual uh, calendar year, um, with our 70% um, uh, share of that, we'd be raising about $930,000. $930,000. And that's the only way that we as a municipality, in my opinion, are going to be able to do paving, roads, you know, uh, buildings, you know, all of the infrastructure things that are important for this municipality to move forward. And I don't see any reason why we shouldn't um, advocate this um, strongly um, as we move into town meeting. I would like to see the town develop their own charter. And it could be a really simple charter dealing with just local option tax to begin with. And it can always be amended in successive uh, legislative years. But um, I think the time is uh, here. I think it's a really important piece um, of our ability to move forward. 
And I don't see any other way uh, unless we find a different revenue source. We also used to have an equipment tax. <clears throat> they ended in 2018. That used to bring in over $100,000. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when they did away with it, they were supposed to move towards a sales tax, but they never did. Right. So I wouldn't be opposed to bringing the equipment tax back either. I think that um, the advantage of a local option tax is the fact that there's two data points. One is just the dollars it generates, but I think the biggest piece of this is where do those tax dollars come from? And so what we're what we're in the process of doing is um, delineating the non-resident resident revenue. You know, and that's the data that we need because if 85% of this tax revenue comes from Morristown residents, I think we need to take a good hard look at that. But if 65 or 70% of that tax revenue comes from people outside our municipality, um, they use our roads, they use our sidewalks, they use our infrastructure. Um, I think that um, that's that's a key component of this. And if it comes to fruition the way I think it might, um, I would really strongly say that $932,000 is a lot of money that can get us, and that's on an annual basis once it's up and running. Um, we um, can accomplish some serious things in this town and, and get some control over our tax rate. Well, I'm totally in favor of, um, partially in favor of this, for certainly for the Airbnbs. We don't have a lot of hotels that will be impacted. Uh, but certainly Airbnbs, and we all know that that is all tourist money. I think um, there's been some talk that we could actually get this to go forward sooner than we had thought. Um, and I think if we did initiate this, that we should not do um, restaurants. And this is, I know this is tricky in talking with Todd, is that part of the uh, interest was because of the grocery stores and indeed we have a huge group of people that come in for the grocery stores, but we need to not um, hurt our, I mean, we don't have a lot of restaurants and I feel unfortunately that this uh, tax would hurt our local restaurants. And so it's a real tricky thing because I understand the grocery stores uh, and I don't know if there's a way to, you know, separate out just restaurants because I agree with the, but we're really at a point where um, we don't have any restaurants. Hoagie's never reopened. The, you know, our restaurants are struggling and the, across the country, they're talking about people are not spending. Um, so if there's any way we cannot do restaurants initially and wait till everything comes back. And uh, so I think looking at a rollout, you know, a way to roll it out or somehow is what I'd like to encourage. How does that affect the business? I mean, what's the what burden would that be on the business to do this? So, so anything that's computerized, um, they would have to, um, you know, retool how they uh, charge that one percent tax. But multiple municipalities. I mean, we're not recreating the wheel here in any way. Many municipalities. Uh, Stroll is the closest one here to us that does all all of its taxes, including sales and use. Um, have accomplished this. And um, I think that they are ahead of the curve. Um, I'm not sure what the overall dollar value uh, would be. Uh, I'm assuming that might be more, um, more of a burden, so to speak, for grocery chains like Hannaford or Price Chopper. But I think for individual uh, businesses, I mean, if the sales tax goes up or alcohol tax goes up, they have to reboot their system. So it's not, I don't think it's rocket science for any of them. I, I can't imagine it would be any kind of uh, financial burden, either. financial burden either. And, uh, you know, I, if you take a look at the tax data, um, you know, all of, uh, all of Morristown, Stowe, I mean, if you go back to 2021, um, there's been an intimation a number of times in our board meetings that somehow businesses are struggling economically. And if you look back at tax data all the way to 21, 22, 23, which encompasses part of COVID, um, all those tax revenues are up in all areas. So our economy is, is doing well here in Morristown. 
Well, and everybody should keep in mind that this would even affect the food truck. So any food truck that came in um, would also have to pay this extra 1%. And um, again, it does impact because that means with the current cost of food prices, you know, that $17 burger just went up because you've added tax. So I to dismiss it and to not realize that uh, if you go out to any of our businesses, they're they're not doing well. The restaurants are, I mean, they're surviving, but they're not flourishing. So that's my point. Anybody else? I just want to say one thing. We said some audience uh, members raising their hand. We're going to save comments till the end. Okay, so. no problem. It would move, move on to downtown designation. And under so, that, you'll notice. That, Judy, I'm sorry. Also, just and, and Judy, I'll be very correct me if I'm wrong. Like, you know, Judy brought in some snacks and things. And so people should feel free to just get up and <laughs> that, right? Okay. So please, you all, the public, like that's what it's here for. So please do. Otherwise, she has to take it all home. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Judy. All right. Along with several others. <laughs> yeah, your light is, you've got a flashing. Can, do you want to sit on the end? Because it's really distracting for me to constantly have a flashing light at. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's so um, downtown designation. Under that, we put town plan, village town boundary, town charter slash village charter, and Airbnb impacts. So we lump those all under the downtown designation. So um, I can start off by the downtown designation and um, it goes with the town plan. We have to re-amend, re -amend, that's not the right word. We have to amend the town plan in order to then go forward to um, apply for downtown designation. And amending the town plan would require, I believe it's one or two sentences or a couple of words in the town plan that can be amended then to resubmit it. I, I fully support um, uh, looking at downtown designation. Again, um, I know, uh, you know in my years in Waterbury on the select board, Waterbury has downtown designation that opens up a whole world of revenue uh, in that area. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the grant process and other uh, revenue sources that come um, state and federal um, it's an opportunity that we're missing, and I think it's a, it would be a shame for us not to really drill down and take a, another hard look at that. So, Judy, I'm Anthony Devon here. Um, when I came on the select board a year and a half ago, the trustees in the select board have been through several iterations of the town plan. 42. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to turn the <laughs> time. I was going to say 30 some odd, but 42. And it uh, became pretty clear that people were getting a little uh, annoyed. Is perhaps a, in, a nice way of saying it. Of, you know, looking at all the changes. And I did. I don't think my vote was uh, put anything over the top, but I did. I did vote to push the town plan through. But I also said that same night, and I asked before I voted for it can we amend this and uh it was made perfectly it was made very clear to me that yeah we can amend it so i agree um judy it would be nice to go back and amend the town plan look at uh looking look at do what look at doing what needs to be done to uh to get it through i believe lcpc is partially what's stopping this at this point and uh and make ourselves available for downtown designation. We there's a whole lot of things we're missing out on right now. Grant money in particular. There's a lot of grant money that we're missing out on. Talk about revenues. We're talking about revenues right now. Um, there's a lot of a lot of uh, grant money that came in years ago to uh, help with a number of things around town. So I'd like to look at reinstating that. I know the uh, Anna, our new. Um... Recreation director was going to be applying for some grants. I was unable because we don't have a downtown designation. So there's there are grants available and um, and possibly there's money available right now. I don't know how long it's going to last. How much grant money is going to last? So 
we want to just kind of jump on this as quickly as we can and take advantage of the money that's available. And, and my understanding is, I know uh, Jason and I've talked about it quite a few is it, and it's actually a fairly simple process. To, it's not as laborious as we had previously thought. So it could happen pretty quick without, it's just a matter of some words. So it's not a whole revision and having to go through major votes and stuff. Am I correct, Jason? Fairly, I mean, it's an amendment. It still yeah. has to be warned uh, for us and the trustees, uh, planning council. So there's it's still some procedural. I don't think it's something that can happen in two months. And, uh, okay. um, I, I'm all for it too. I just have a couple of questions. I know, and Todd, you might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but Act 250 gets waived or a lot of this stuff. Like if, if we get a town designation, then instead of going to a 16 unit apartment, we can go to a 32. Is that correct? Or something is something on line? Threshold limit is correct. And that's that's my concern is that <laughs> that being done in the town, you know, doubling the amount that can be built. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing, it's a bad thing. I don't know if it's just something I want to kind of bounce off everybody because that's I think the town downtown designation is good, but if it has something to do you know, with the act 250, that's something yep. to think about. Don't know if maybe that's something we can amend down the road too. Yeah, I'm no. not sure. I just want to bring that up. You That's know. a good point. So going on to, I'm not quite sure what the town charter or village town boundary. Someone wants to speak to that? When that I think that came off the um, trustees list and it was an earlier list. When at one point, I know there was a idea being floated that to accommodate the charter issue that you know, there was this idea that you'd amend the, the, the suck board was interested in amending the boundaries of the village. Um, as, and then changing our charter to include um, the op ability to raise the, the, the local option tax. I don't know if that's still a current proposal or not, but that's where I believe this came from. Todd, is this not um, the discussion of um, extending the, the village to in, include a little more property for uh, the areas that already have sewer lines run? Um, Increasing the village lines because now we have. If you're doing your own separate charters, I don't think we need to discuss playing with the town village boundary lines. So there, this was okay. Yeah, there, I, I think, think so. this is a good right? topic because you've okay. also okay. Your own way. Great. I think it is too because the town researching their own charter okay. as we speak. Yeah, so. All right. I think this would be great to be one community. There are efficiencies and cost savings there, but for what you're doing right now, this is a this is a good point. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So, and then the other would be, um, so we've kind of talked about the charter already. I don't know if anyone wants to talk about that anymore. Well, I, I've, I've been in favor of a town charter and we did look at, you know, options. Um, and again, I think this is something we've discovered can happen sooner than later also. Um, I, it opens up lots of things I would like to um you know, there's a few other things I'd like to add that other towns are already doing. I am, am, am in agreement with Chris that we keep it simpler and not um, start adding things that require reinventing the will. But there are a lot of things that are already very established policies um, in other towns that we could um, put onto the town plan uh, and like maybe two or three to get it passed, uh, to get it passed, because I think it would be uh, really, really uh, beneficial for us. We just, I think we're going to have to, we need to go that area. So we haven't heard a lot from Travis or Bob or Richard or Brad. Do you have anything to add? Do anything we've talked about so far? Because we kind of like, we're going through our timelines pretty quickly. You're happy? Next. We, well, we have uh, Airbnb impacts. So I think the um, Laura kind of alluded to that. Does anyone have any? And I know, Tom, when you were talking about this, it's, you feel it's mainly impacting uh, the town and less the village? So I believe the uh, the town has more Airbnb than the village does. So you have different roles? Definitely not. I'm sorry? You have different roles. I think we're the, I think our roles are the same. No. No? They are now. But for oh, five years, they weren't. They yeah. weren't, yes. They were more stricter than the village. I think yeah, you had rules that we didn't. Exactly. Yes. Right. The other piece of this, because I think, again, this came from the trustees, but it's a list from like three or four months ago, is there was um, 
the trustees had some interest in talking about this because of the quote. I, I'll get the percentage wrong, but Todd had talked about the rate of growth of Airbnbs. Um, and so there's this housing crisis in Vermont, right? And, and yet we have all this development, but if, if a big percentage of them are all getting converted to Airbnbs, there's nowhere for local people to live, even if you have a whole lot of new housing development. So I think that was also part of, and again, it's less a village issue, we think, than the town issue, but I think that was the other angle. And I don't, do you remember the quote? I'm putting you on the spot. It was like eight months ago. You yeah, gave no, some big quote. It's significant, though. Yeah. And we camp that down with the new rule respect on town growth. The explosion of Airbnb is in the town. The town was unregulated for years. But since we've had the regulation of the town, the growth rates almost Slow. flattened out. Good. It's still growing because you can still have an Airbnb as long as it's your one Vermont property. So we're still seeing conversions, but the rate is dramatically decreased. It was just something to watch, I think. But uh, trustee, I, I'm picking up on things that you all talked about. So trying to refresh your memory. <laughs> it was a long time ago. I'm, I'm happy that, that the town finally joined the village in, in uh, restricting and regulating the uh, Airbnbs. Very quickly, I, I would agree. Um, I'm very glad that I was on the same page as with the village. I am too. I fought hard for a long time for it. And living in the town, it's made a significant uh, difference in the neighborhoods. And going to number five, um, coordination of highway, sewer, and water. None of that under that we put coordination of utility works. So I think they all kind of go together. Uh, we'll put you on the on, on the spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we Facetiming over there. <laughs> Just talking about coordination with the town and the utilities and the village who start working in that relationship out. I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's any issue, big issues. I just want to make sure that we're kind of aware of what we're all doing because we have to start a project and find out, well, we got to dig up the road to get the water line in. And then that doesn't really, it either slows down the project or adds money to it. And I just think um, just making sure we're all on the same page on any new development or, or any uh, anything new come to town or any kind of changes that's going to affect both the village and the town. A particular example, just to put it on the table, is you know, and Kevin, correct me if I get the wrong street, but I think you know the plan has been for a couple of years to we have a lot of work to do on Best Street and the and the pavement more resembles rubble than pavement at this point, and so I you know that it's just an example of you know we ought to make sure it, we, I think at this point we're wondering which year you're going to be paving that because no point in us finishing the destruction of the street and then letting you sit there for three years, you know, and. You know, so it's just an example, but those sort of things, and it, I think Kevin would agree. We have a great relationship with Kevin on your staff, and we talk about these things, but just want to make sure that we're always communicating about these things. So, on that note, Scott, does, does Kevin attend trustee meetings? Our Kevin or your Kevin? Uh, sorry, our, our Kevin. Kevin. Our <laughs> Kevin does. Sorry. Our Kevin does. He's there two sometimes. Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Yeah. No, it's more that the two Kevins talk and compare notes, and and hopefully that. You know, I think the point here is we got to make sure that gets light of day to both boards, right? So that you're aware um, that the coordination is happening and that our capital plans are in sync. I think that's the point, right? And, and especially with the budget, you know, being the way it is, yeah. you know, we might not have the funds to do something that we'd have to come and contract out. So that's which is fine, but we just, you know, that coordination is the big way to so. Is, is there any kind of coordination as far as when permits are issued? Do, you, uh, do, do any of you guys kind of review permits just to see developments? I'm sure you do. Yeah, yeah Todd sends us a list. Yeah. Monthly, okay. monthly sends yeah, us so a that's... list of development. And frankly, if something is really going on, that he, he, he kind of keeps his eye open for us. I won't say he catches 100%, but he catches most of them. Okay. If he, he, even before he sends us the monthly list, yeah. he'll... If something comes in and he knows we're going to have heartburn, he calls me and okay. says, "Hey, you might want to look at this." <laughs> great, <laughs> which is great. We really appreciate that partnership. Scott, <clears throat> uh, can I ask you a question about is the trustee is the village using any type of an app or a mapping system that shows where you're working and what you're doing? We have systems like that. We're not using it for capital improvements yet. Okay. Okay. We could add a layer someday. Kevin's been learning how to do that the last two days. So, you know, so but we'll probably get there. Did the state system not pick up some of our local? I don't believe so. When the whole flood thing was happening, we could go on and get the roads that were 
Those are usually state roads. Yeah, it looks state. Yeah. Makes sense. I believe. Yeah. All right, moving on. Next Statewide zoning impacts. The last 100. <laughs> That's 100. Is, is uh, another step toward um, standardizing zoning uh, for municipalities throughout the state. And we started seeing this back when they required uh, towns to be a part of the uh, Regional Planning Commission years ago. And, and here we are. And they're it's an overlord uh, piece of this stuff. Um, I don't, I don't really know what to do about it, but it's uh, it's here and it's not going to get any better. I mean, Scott's referred to it in terms of utilities. We're going to see this more in in our zoning, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's disturbing on a number of levels. Is basically they're saying this is what you need to do and, and like, this is what you have to do and you're going to have to curtail your your uh, zoning to meet these requirements. And, um, it's just uh, it, it's again it's disturbing. I, 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 I'm at a loss really to know what to do about it. I guess the question is what what should we be what should we know that we have to do and what should we know what we don't have to do right now at this, at this phase? Because uh, I'm not sure when it takes effect, really when the actual effective date is. And then if we don't comply, what happens? Um, um, so I just, I'm not sure what we need to be doing and not doing in preparation for this new change. And perhaps, you know, talk and speak to it. But I mean, S100 is about 100 pages long. And um, it's pretty extensive. Um, and uh, I don't know what the timeline is to adjust um, you know, local zoning bylaws to, to uh, match the stuff. I know some of it's particularly the duplex and rather than a single family home is part of the proposals that we're going to be talking about tonight. But, uh, Todd, do you have an idea? I think the planning council and I have a pretty good handle on it at this juncture. We discussed it, we discussed it a few times. I've actually uh, condensed the entire law, which you said is thick, it's this, into nine, uh, nine points to do list. And we talked about that last night. The, uh, one of the main things that will require uh, you all to work together is if we're gonna change our source of risk management area, um, because the way the law works, for those who don't know, S100 made single family zoning illegal in Vermont. It's illegal to restrict a single family zoning. And in a village setting where there's water and sewer, it's four units minimum unless you're smart about it. We think we have a way to be smart about it. We'll see about that to keep it a single family. Uh, <laughs> there's, always, there's always a way around rules. Work with them. That's probably a better way to say it. Um, but the, tap, the bill does take away local control, especially in terms of where water and sewer is present. So when a village has infrastructure, it takes away some local control. So we can look at different ways to do lot sizes or different ways to uh, restrict or shrink our sewer service management area. It's a zoning layer we have right now that says where sewer lines can go and, and not go. It's never really been enforced. It's just there. I updated it. But we may have to work with the trustees on that to right size it uh, if we want to. Because one of the bigger issues we're potentially seeing is this the trustees may not want future sewer extensions or water extensions at the town. That's a big, big issue for the town in terms of growth because if there's no sewer extensions in the town, you guys aren't going to be groundless growth after next year. You may have negative groundless growth. You may shrink. Uh, it's really, really impactful. It's probably the most important thing that I talked about tonight is the sewer extension and water extension piece. And the stage of each village, that means all the projects that are coming up online are all, they're all dead that are in the town. The village can keep going, but the town can't. So maybe the village and town needs to talk about uh, a sewer service management agreement. St. Albans did that. Uh, the new person the town select board is working for the special projects actually championed that agreement in St. Albans, where the town and the town helps pay the village for its sewer, sewer allotment, how that structure works. We may need to do something here at this point, but that's part of what's going to drive. That will be driven by S100. I think we have ways to avoid that, but I think it's a discussion that has to be had and be on the table. So but overall, I, overall in the big picture, before I start, Judy, we're going to be doing S100 this winter into the spring. We're expecting the legislature to tweak it, and we'll be live with to, to accommodate any changes. So we're not going to push forward a zoning proposal in February, for example, and have the legislature tweak something in March or April when they close up the session. So we'll be live when they're live. As soon as they're done, there are no tweaks, there are no veto sessions. 
we'll push through, we'll push forward all the S-1 under corrections to the select board and trustees for approval. Hopefully that will go efficiently and we'll see. So they're not restricting water or uh, septic and wells um, in the outlying areas? No, just the outlying areas, it's duplexes now. Every, every There's no such thing as single family zoning, everything's a duplex. Even in like a two acre lot? Correct, even in a 50 acre lot. But I don't understand. It's confusing because the state doesn't want sprawl. Well, the state just got some. <laughs> I agree with you. Okay. Uh, so one of the things the planning council is looking at, for example, two acre lots, we may make them four acre lots. So we, the planning council has been very careful to put density in the village and keep the countryside and rural as possible. So if we don't want the state that's 100 act to basically double the density of the town in areas like Sterling Valley, Mud City, or Elmore Mountain Road, where it's we want it to remain rural. We may increase the lot size to basically cut off S100 at the knees. So it's a four acre lot now instead of two acre lot, so it's density neutral. That's something the planning council may consider and may put forth on your table for approval for both boards. The only thing I would add to what um, Todd said is, um, which you probably didn't say because you, you already know, but just to remind you, you have the first piece of S100 in front of you now in the, in the current zoning changes, which is the right. parking change, um, right. which is really a uh, a, a proposal designed for Winooski and Burlington where they have you no know, um, fixed transit service with with short headways um, where you can have fewer cars per unit and but it's been applied statewide um, and so that's in the zoning change that was the one thing that has to be done to your timeline question has to be done by the end of the year I think was is that the right time pretty much everything's live at this point now a lot right. of it came live on uh, July 1st it was in September but everything is live at this counter there's a few things that aren't until next year yeah there's a few other things yeah. that aren't local yeah. zoning stuff but the, the local but that one live. You, you both have you've all had your public hearing so mm -hmm. I know at our next trustee meeting they'll be theoretically voting on the, the zoning changes including the parking one so <laughs> And as long as we all match what we're doing, the trustees want to approve the zoning without the parking changes. That's okay. I'll still have to deal with S100, but the select board just has to match their vote. So if you don't, the select board wants to keep the parking changes and the trustees don't, it's a good time to talk about it because ultimately your votes need to match on the 1st of November, then the 7th of November, or 6th of November when the select board gets. And I didn't raise it because I know that the trustees are against it. I just wanted to make sure you were aware it's on the table. <laughs> we don't have a choice, do we? It's the law. I mean, if we if you vote it down, I'll put it I'll put in the next zoning change too. I mean, it is the law. So, for example, even though we're not live with duplexes in town, I got my third I got my third application today to approve a duplex. I'm I'm approving the duplex even though the zoning our current zoning doesn't support it. I have to comply with the law. So, whether you guys approve or don't approve the parking changes, I'm still going to regulate a one parking space per unit. So, if you want to kind of stick your thumb at the state and say we don't like your, your we don't like your mandates from Montpelier. Forward, I'm good with it. I'll back you up 100%, but I'm still going to abide by the law. We're now at one parking space for dwelling unit, whether we like it or not. So, I guess it begs the question how do the trustees feel about the proposed uh, zoning bylaws? We voted now, I'd vote yes. The thing about the one parking spot, when I first heard it, I thought you could only have one parking spot. No, you can only mandate one parking spot. You, you can have as many parking spots as right. you want to use a landfill. Right. So my first impression was I was against it. If you can have as many parking spots as you have land for, I'm fine with it. Yeah, so yeah, I would vote for it as it is right now. The entire package that's been presented. Yeah. Uh, how do the rest of you feel about it? And Todd, are, um, is anything grandfathered here or is everything like the developments that we currently have in town that require one and a half? Does it all go to one now? They can, they can come back and revise their permit and go to one, but it's really not a concern for me. The larger developments like the one by Bob's house, for example, that aren't downtown, oversupply their parking. They're not doing one minimum. They have one and a half to two parking spaces per unit. So I'm not super concerned about it. The, uh, the only issue is our downtown sharing the parking lot and capacity there, but that's not S100 change. That's just a management for the town select board issue. So, but the current permit holders can come back. The, and, they could, yes. And they can come it. back and try to develop their parking lots where they have extra parking if they wanted to. I don't foresee that as a reality, but I, I can't predict the future. Okay. 
It just, I'll just say this, it just irks me because it doesn't affect Elmore, doesn't affect Hyde Park, doesn't affect Wolfgang, all those that, just Morrisville is affected by this because we have, and we're being penalized for having infrastructure. And to me, it just, mm -hmm. besides being an overreach, I think there's just another kick in the old gut. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that. All right, what do we have next? Anybody else? Anything uh, to say? All good? We're all pretty fast. Yeah, yeah we are. Yeah. Um, uh, number seven, last one. Village separating from the town and forming a city. <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was uh, some rumors going around that the, the select board of the town wanted to just absorb the village and take the infrastructure. And I suggested at a meeting, why don't we do what Essex did? The town can have the town and we'll have the village. We'll become a city. So... That's where it came from. <laughs> That's where it came from. We were wondering where it came from. <laughs> the talk about ending the village ends. Talk about that. Do you have any information on it? Like what it requires or benefits or anything like that? No, I'm sure I could find out. I mean, I don't have a desire, but I'm just curious if there's any information. No, I mean, the village owns the infrastructure. The town doesn't. Right. That's what this was all about. I know it in Waterbury. Um, you know, we had duplications and everything from zoning to highway to fire departments, um, two distinctly separate municipalities. And the village trustees were also overseers of water and sewer. And we merged all of the you know, departments. Um, so essentially, the village owned assets in terms of real real estate as well as the utilities. Um, and um, several years, uh, probably three years ago, the village decided to disband. Um, there was an agreement made between the town and the village in terms of the real estate assets and cash assets. Um, they worked out a mutual agreement on how they would be handled. And the village essentially became a utility district and um, and own and operate that in, in perpetuity. The town had no desire. Um, it's functioned really well that way as a utility district uh, for um, over a century now. Um, you know, I guess it just depends at some point whether the village see themselves in that, in that vein um, um, or not. But I, I've never, you know, uh, I guess considered or thought that you know, the town would become the state and be an overlord of the village <laughs> assets or their other utilities. So, well, I guess the question is are you guys, is this a, are you really considering this or was this just a? There was a reaction to the considerations I was hearing around town. Just clearing the air. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. I think, yeah, no, that, I think that's what's important to know that, mm -hmm. yeah. Safe to say it hasn't come from the select board in the last year and a half. It might be might be before that, but I think there was some talk before that. Yeah. And we merged the highway department probably 25 years ago. Right. Yeah, I mean you have a you know high a town highway department, a town fire department. You know, yeah. Um, there's some um, Duplicity in terms of appointing members of you know zoning and stuff, but um, yeah, I mean I think that um, you know we're if it's not broken, why fix it? I guess. It is. But I, I, yeah, I'm looking at some of the um, topics that were brought up. Especially number two, the new and emergent state energy policy impacts that. It sounds like the select board needs to look at it. I don't know how going forward, but it looks like we need to look at that on an agenda item at some point. And then um, we'll be looking at the um, local option tax and the town plan. And I guess the statewide zoning, which that'll come That'll be its own entity coming from the planning council, basically. Um, oh, the public charging, I didn't see what that was coming under. Oh, that's going to be the public charging stations, collaboration, and businesses. That's all the new emergent state rules, I think. 
That's what that's coming in. Yeah. yeah. You, have, you have time for that. That's not urgent. That's more like visioning for you for what's coming at you. It's not urgent for this or next year. But you what but when, when should it start being it should be start being looked at? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say we should start working more with with um, on the planning council because some of the that's where the first pressure is going to come. Okay. Um, for these things is you know new development or redevelopment, it's going to more start there. Um, and we're starting to have some businesses approach us about you know what would it take for us to add vehicle charging. So mm -hmm. you might start getting those requests. So yeah. you know so. That's going to be the early stuff, but it's, you know, again, I think I'm guessing most of that would be planning council stuff first. That's where you probably want it to go, I'm guessing, but, but eventually it will come to you as you know, your, your community, the folks that deal with the businesses, and the, you know, it'll start showing up in, in lots of places. Oh, so that, that's good to know. It's for direction that yeah. it has a place to start. <clears throat> Great. Um, what about, uh, the new and emerging state energy policy. More, I mean, this what we're talking about is things that we can do, but this other doesn't. Yeah. It sounds pretty other than abstract. Other than what Don mentioned, which is make sure that you know to the extent that you have any concerns about this stuff, that you know the, the more that you can talk to your legislators, the better off we all are. And and if you decide you're interested in that and you want, you know, like kind of cheat sheet, just tell me. You know, I read them for the trustees all the time, so. Um, you know, so happy to be helpful in, in putting together kind of what the key issues are for them to be aware of. Um, so when they when they get the deluge of, you know, here's what you have to do from out of state lobbyists, sometimes that they have some information about what people at home want, right? Would you be willing to do that for us, George? Yeah, yeah I think that ought to be on our yeah. stuff to do list. Yeah. yeah, absolutely happy to. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have we have time. Does anybody? Nice. I just want to give Trisha a minute to speak. Sure. Trisha Um I would like to go back to this 1% option tax that we're talking about, and that we're floating around the table here. Um, we talked about this as a, um, like how this would affect our businesses. We pay that tax. This is not going to affect our businesses negatively by any means. This is a win-win situation. I mean, I was recently in Stowe, and Sarah McCain, who does their planning, said, why are you even round going round and round about this? I mean, this should be a given to all of you. Like, you have to remember, this isn't, our restaurants aren't going to hurt from this. They're going to be collecting it from everyone who comes in. And I hear what you're saying, Laura. I don't agree with you about our local restaurants. There may be a few that are not doing so well, but most of our restaurants you live right now, there is waiting lines. And, and you can go right through them. I mean, I don't know how many of you eat out. But go to Deb's place in the morning. Go go to Hoagie's. The other day, there was a line out the door at Hoagie's. I mean, these are just little town restaurants. I don't see, and I have not heard of any restaurants in this town that are not doing very well. Um, just my own thought, but the option, I think we all should be on that page. That is a, a big revenue source for this community, that it could do a lot of good moving forward. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing here, we can open up to the public. Well, is there anything else that's not on the list that anyone wants to bring forward? Actually, I, one question. I don't know if there's any way that we can join forces to kind of advocate against some of these mandates. Um, if we have some power all coming together to try to get in front of some of these rather than waiting for them to... <laughs> Hit us. So, if anybody has any suggestions on thoughts about trying to get in front of some of these mandates, um, you know, and maybe a course of action to advocate to prevent it would be huge. Well, I think what I would say we already talked about being in touch with legislators, but I think between folks like Todd and I and Trish and others, you know, we hear maybe not as soon as we should, but we hear what's going on down there. Yeah. And so, making sure you're all aware. So that you know, occasionally, you know, someone from the select board or the trustees actually can go and testify. Yeah, um, yeah. That is, you know, the, the you know those two mechanisms talking quietly to legislators mm -hmm. and then testifying at the committees yeah. is how the legislators get information from real Vermonters yeah. that are actually going to be impacted. 
Um, and I don't mean to say that lobbyists are not really Vermonters, most of them are, <laughs> but the real Vermonters who are paid to push a certain perspective, not necessarily good or bad for the state, but it's just their job. You also have a job as select board members and trustees to push a certain perspective, which is what, what's right for this community. So there ought to be balance in that and what they hear, right? That's the point. And what we can, Todd certainly, I'm sure through his, he hear, he'll hear about what they're talking about down there about the next intrusion from zoning, you know, the, the, the daughter of Act 100. Um, the legislators were not responsive to me last year. One never responded and one only got back to me was, patronizing is probably not, not the right word, but it's the only word I can come up with on Act 100. So is there a way for us to find out when we can go testify? Is there just, a schedule somewhere? Just schedule after and we'd have to it. help you find all of that. But yeah, they, they usually post schedules on like a Monday for committee meetings that week. It doesn't mean that they always hold exactly. And right. usually we'll reach out and ask to be on the witness list. And most of the time you'll get you, particularly if you're a town official, they, they're they pretty deferential to letting town officials testify. Well, every you know, remember the chair of every committee kind of runs their committee. so. Not all chairs run by the same rules, so just saying that out yeah. loud. But most of the time, they do want to hear from you when you represent a community. So, and you said you do this business, so if I've got it wrong, by all no, means. No, you don't. And uh, <laughs> so, two things occur to me. One is, is that the legislature goes back into session the first week of January. So, if there's a stuff to do list for our legislators, would it make sense for us to have another joint meeting? And invite the legislators here and have a sit down with them so that they can become advocates on one end of it. In terms of when they go into session, every day there's an introduction of bills both in the Senate and the House. So you can track every day everything that's introduced on both sides of the, of the legislature. And I think that, you know, whether it's a, a select board member and a trustee that does that. So that we're aware of any introductions because that's that's where it begins. And then you reach out to the clerk, clerk of the committee, um, what you want to speak to, and then you can either do it by Zoom or in person, and, uh, and then you go and represent. But that's that's the process. Thank you. Sure. You want to take that? Yeah. Okay. We'll go ahead and go uh, open it up to public comment. Uh, just remind everybody uh, you'll have two minutes. <laughs> Comments and then uh, if you want to speak again, just please wait for the other people to go talk and then you can speak again. Uh, Judy or Bonnie will be I have the two minute disclaimer. Do they need to approach the speaker? I don't know. Do they need to approach the speaker? You're going to be back there, just use your outside voice. If, if, yeah. if you don't have an outside voice, kind of step up between Don and Bob. And because this is very sensitive. Um, for that, and the only thing I would add, Tom, just they, they'll want to know who you are, so your name would be important to say as well. Yeah. Okay, okay two minutes. Thank you for that. Walk up. <laughs> you talk quietly. I know that. <laughs> Some people would just do that. But anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, I'll be real quick. What's, what's your name? My name's Tom Pudia, <laughs> and I live in Morrisville, uh, Morristown. And I uh, appreciate you opening up to the public. And uh, one thing I would just real quickly, and uh, I'll get through, is uh, once the talk about the city, uh, the few that was in the air, well, what is in the air with a few of the town residents is uh, the question of merging. It would appear to me, and it, but the uh, first look at this, it would say every town. Uh, taxpayer money uh, over a period of time uh, if the if the town merged it in like like Essex. So what I'm requesting is from the department heads uh, uh, if I could get uh, the cons and the pros and cons of a merge of the village to the uh, to the town. And I know that it would it would take a petition uh, five years to get it done. But uh, I would like to know and have your input. I know Scott gave you a very elaborate uh, insight into the history of, of the town, and, and I appreciate that very much. But uh, it's in the air, that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll go in here. 
I'm Joshua Goldstein, I'm on Planning Council. Uh, two quick things. I echo Chris's comment about the local option, especially the rooms and meals. This is easy, low hanging fruit. And to your point, Laura, a seventeen dollar burger is going to go up seventeen cents. I, for one, every time I buy a burger, would be happy to throw seventeen cents in the jar for this town. And I think to your point, whether we live here or not, tourists or not, like you're putting into your town. It's not that. I mean, like, high tax rates aside, like a, a few extra pennies on the aggregate really adds up. Um, my only comment about that one is I hope you two work together and we've talked about it in planning council. Figure out where that money's going to go because if you do it and then there's this pot and everybody's fighting over it, like we tried to find like three areas where it could go and that's uh, just my encouragement to you. Um, regarding the legislature, I'm really happy to hear that. I just want to plant this seed as that might germ. Um, Todd has floated in, in Massachusetts when they blanket zone the whole state. There was a qualification. We've we've done our hard work to, mm -hmm. to create housing, and we've done a damn good job, I think. Um, I'm testing the side. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to float an idea for this session, say like, hey, because I hope there's other towns that have been doing a good job, Brattleboro probably, some others, you know, that, that are on the come up. And if we can somehow by April say like, we already did it, you know, we don't qualify. It, it's gonna like spent half a dozen years, as you all know, writing this zoning, and it's kind of the wrinkles are out of it. To throw it in the trash can is is a kick in the gut, as you say. Um, <laughs> it's a kick somewhere else. Okay, so we do it all. And then and then it may change again. So if you get those guys in a room or you're testifying, say like, hey, we've done our work, what other towns have done it, and try to fly that flag. That's, that's my idea. So if we did have a local option tax, it would go to the town, I assume. If it's in your charter, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's in our Depending charter. Whose charter it's like. All right. <laughs> I believe I'm not an expert on this, but that's how I believe it would work. Right. Charter first, vote of the residents to to um, first vote a local option tax, vote on a town charter, and then the town charter would go to the legislature for approval. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? No. We need to make a motion. We didn't really make a motion to start. Do we need to make a motion? No, no. There's, not, okay. well, there's nothing else. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.